You've got that, thank you. Greetings all and welcome to all of you, wherever you've come from tonight to come and have a little bit of a listen, a little bit of a listen into our chat, uh, which is a part of a series of chats about Varroa. Um, my name's Simon Mildred, I'm from Hive Keepers, who is responsible for Hive Buddy. And I'm not gonna steal Carmel's show, she's gonna talk to you a little bit about what Hive Buddy is shortly, but it's a real thrill to have you here and to be able to share with you um, stories and experiences from our community. And in doing that, we have such a great um, opportunity to, to learn and to um, gain knowledge and insights from other people who have been there, who have seen it, who have felt it and know a little bit what it's all about. And obviously, as people are a little bit concerned at the moment about what's going on with Varroa, um, we're trying to do something different. We're trying to remove some of that concern and stress and get people just thinking proactively about, hey, what's this all about? And there's no better way than to hear from people who have been there, done that. That's enough about that, because I know Carmel will talk a little bit more in a minute. There is one thing I just wanted to bring your attention to, and some of you here in this audience will absolutely know about this. And that is our honey tasting program that we've actually got happening at the moment. It's just a good time to tell you while we wait for the last few people to come into the room, but we've got an, a honey tasting program that we're offering people at the moment. Um, and that's it's sort of like an intermediate level one. And I don't know if you've heard of Jess Locanini. She's a honey sommelier and she is running that program coming up soon. I'm gonna put a link in the chat shortly uh, for if you want to learn more where you can find out about that. But that program is a pretty special program and we can't wait to do that as Hive Buddy uh, in conjunction with Jess Locanini. Um, tonight, a little bit about the conduct of this session. You're going to be introduced in a moment to uh, Carmel and Hawken, they're gonna have a conversation with you and I'm just gonna slip away and hide behind the scenes here. But what I do wanna see is if you've got questions or thoughts that relate to tonight's session, then put it in the chat and we'll try and keep an eye on all of those chat comments. There's obviously a lot often come through, but as you're thinking about something and maybe even as you think about something at the beginning um, that you're thinking about right now that you wanna know a bit more, maybe put that there and we'll always do our best to hopefully answer that uh, for you. Uh, one thing that we're not trying to do tonight is we're not standing on a soapbox telling you how to do something. We're not getting political. We're not trying to um, bring down um, the efforts by government and what have you. It doesn't matter what you think about that. That's not what we're here to do tonight. We're here to literally have a conversation in a proactive and positive manner. So when you think about those questions that you've got in the chat, just have that in the, in the back of your mind. Now that's absolutely more than enough from me. I'd now like to introduce you to Carmel Gerdson, who many of you would have known and experienced before. Carmel is our most wonderful community manager here on the Hive Buddy network. And she is, I'm very proud to have her as part of that team. And over to you, Carmel, for what is gonna be a great conversation tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. That was lovely. I like being here too. Um, and I'm, I am having so much fun helping to develop this platform. Um, so um, as part of our development of this platform, I'm just going to go through a few things tonight and then I will introduce our guest speaker. Um, but I wanted to just bring your awareness to um, you probably would have received an email to, today saying, welcome to Hive Buddy. And some of you might have been here for a while and some of you are new. We are putting into place a new email system with some email sequences because we understand that the Mighty Networks Hive Buddy platform, there's a lot going on in it. You know, we've got our community chat, we've got our B Club, we've got our, our specialised learning areas and learning to navigate all of that can be a little confusing at times. Um, also, some of the features on a laptop are different to what you will get on a mobile phone. So this email sequence hopefully um, will step you through some things to help you in your journey in Hive Buddy so that you can get the most out of um, the platform and not give up and go, this is just too hard and difficult because we understand it. it's a lot to take in at first. So we wanna help step you through that. Um, I want to um, also want to bring your attention to our photo competition. We've already had some people have um, contributed photos to that photo competition. So for those that don't know about it, we are creating a Hive Buddy calendar. And over the next 12 months, we're going to have a competition each month. Um, sometimes there'll be a theme, but if you want to contribute a photo to that, 
Um, the winner of that will be announced at our B Club meetings. And um, that photo will then go into the collection of the calendar. And that calendar will be available for purchase, but we're also going to use it as some prizes for people because we've got our ambassador um, award system for people that reach out to other members in our, in, and invite them into Hive Buddy. So we want to acknowledge that loyalty uh, in this platform. So remember the way you vote is to just give a, it's a heart, so give them a heart um, and, and if you haven't put a photo in there yet, um, please do. And I'm also loving some of the captions. Maybe those captions could go with the photos when we put the calendar together. I don't know, but um, I'm loving the conversation that's going on there. Um, B Club, which I've already mentioned, we are launching the first week of August is going to be our B, start of our B Club. Um, pretty soon, um, we've, we've created the space. Pretty soon, we'll make it available for you to go into that space. And we're all going to give the first B Club to everybody free. So you're all invited. Um, and, after, and we'll have our Beginner's Corner and Anna, who we said hello to before. Anna is one of our mentors on Hive Buddy. She's going to run our first Beginner's Corner on our B Club. And we'll have a special guest speaker, which we'll be announcing in, within the next week. Um, and then um, in September, it'll, it'll become, so B Club will be $59 for the year. Um, and we think it's $6 casually. So, um, and we'll be, once we've got it sorted, we've got a, a pretty big um, guest speaker in mind. If we can get them, I've got my fingers crossed. Um, and the beauty about Hive Buddy is because we're online, we can get anybody from anywhere. So we're hoping that every month is going to be exciting and we can bring some pretty special um, guest speakers to you all and some really good mentors. Um, I know um, Daz has also put his hand up to help with a beginner's corner for one of the bee clubs. And look, if there's any other beekeepers in our group that do have some experience, you don't have to be a mentor, but you might have, you know, there might be like you might be a flow hive expert or a top bar expert or a long Langstroth expert or, you know, you've been beekeeping for a while and you've got some wisdom to share um, or you've been through a really full on experience and you want to share that. This beginner's corner is going to be at the beginning of every monthly bee club. So um, feel free to send me a private message. It's a, um, a little section called hello. And, um, and I'll start putting together a list of people that can help out with that beginner's corner. So um, what else did I want to mention? Um, ah, okay. Now I'm just going to quickly share my screen and share. And okay, so I just want to go over again. Um, hopefully all of you are all over these pages now. But just remember for our official updates, we need to go to the New South Wales Department of Primary Industries and click on Varroa Mite. They have all the latest announcements, the updates of the map and all of that sort of thing, what they're planning. Um, also Agriculture Victoria, for those of us in Victoria, um, the South Australian one, the Queensland one, you'll all have your state stuff that you need to look at as well. And then the other one that's really helpful, if you haven't had a look at that yet, and this is Arbic. And I just wanted to draw your attention to this post that Arbic made on the 3rd of July. Now, for those beekeepers in New South Wales, if you haven't seen this, um, they have arranged support for beekeepers. So there are some free confidential support services. If you are stressed out, if you're going through a hard time, if you're worried, um, financial counselling, mental counselling, all sorts of things. So they've got a big list there. That was posted on the 3rd of July. So, you know, if you need some support, please reach out. And I just wanted to share with you that um, Simon and I are also working on um, someone else that can perhaps give a different perspective because we do understand that this process, you know, for all of us around Australia, we're worried. But for those people, especially in the red zones, we understand it's heartbreaking. And so 
Um, we have a little special something that we're working on and we'll keep you up to date with that. Um, so without further ado, to change and shift the energy a little bit, I would like to introduce Hawken. Hawken started beekeeping in 2008 in Sweden. Um, so his climate is quite different to Australia. And my remarkable, my list is just gone. Um, and in 2000 and in December 2017, so he'd been beekeeping almost 10 years, he came to Australia because his, um, his wife's family lives here in Australia. And his father-in-law had 300 hives, is that right, Hawken? Back in the day, he had 400, but he 400 had around hives. There you uh, go. Yeah, so, so Hawken in, kind of inherited um, his father-in-law's beehives. And his wife got a job down here in Victoria. So he moved from Queensland. He spent about six months in Queensland, moved down to Victoria. And on his way through, he actually dropped hives off at the almonds. So that was part of his moving process. Um, and he, he arrived here. So you've now been in, in Melbourne since December 2017 and based in the northern suburbs. But Hawken and I do quite a bit of work together. So he's around the western suburbs a bit as well. Um, but, you know, Hawkins started beekeeping with Faroa. So I thought he would um, have a really good perspective on how he got a handle on all of that. And um, I'm sure he's got some quite interesting tales to tell about his whole beekeeping journey. So I'm going to hand it over to you, Hawkins. Thanks for your time tonight. I hope everyone enjoys tonight. Oh, and at the end, um, we'll have about 20, 30 minutes of presentation. And then if you've got any questions, please put them in the chat. And um, I, will, I will go through and we'll ask all those questions at the end. So go for it, Hawken. All right. Thank you for having me. Yes, I've been keeping bees since uh, 2008. And uh, this if you can see it, was my go-to book. Ah, there's my background, stuffing it up possibly. But it's the book about beekeeping in Swedish. Um, and it's basically like the uh, Robert Owen's book, but written for Swedish uh, environments. Uh, and I've also prepared a little presentation. Uh, let's see how I get that up on here. You should be able to share your screen. Yep, share that one, I think. Does that come up? Do you see a slideshow? We've got it. Yep. 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 All right. So I started with two hives. Well, before then, I was working at Ericsson and uh, we started with beekeeping as a hobby when we got a little acreage outside of town. Um, and Ericsson decided to offer me pay for not working for them. So I decided to pop over here uh, since the weather here is quite much nicer. Um, I started with two hives in 2008 and it turns out I'm a quite useless hobbyist. So 2009, it was four. Uh, 2010 it was eight and 2011 I was down to four in the beginning of the uh, season because then I had a little account with Varroa and doing other things wrong and etc but steadily I just kept growing hives and here I started with 50 from my father-in-law's hive and I have around 100 I'm probably going to be staying around this number maybe a little bit higher uh, there's a little bit difference in uh, beekeeping in Sweden compared to here. Um, you have a proper winter. And we had, this is the first winter. This is a winter between 2008 and 2009. And we had around half a meter of snow. And for me, getting bees with Varroa mite, that was getting bees if you think about it when you if you have a cattle or, or or a dog or something you have the heartworm you give them a tablet for or you you drench your cattle for 
parasites and things like that. So for me, when I started, bees with varroa or bees without varroa, there was the same thing. And I, over the years after my little failures in the beginning, I had to start to work out a routine how to uh, do things proper. And my first attempt in the beginning was to do everything by the book. I got hold of all the um, books available. I went to the seminars, I went to the meetings, I went to reading here and reading there. So these books means Varroa Shampening the Ecologiska Methods means fighting Varroa with ecologic methods is one of the booklet. Uh, fighting Varroa with um, uh, uh, queen caging. And then there's charts and things on how to use everything. And uh, I was trying to follow this by the letter. And when you do everything by the letter, and I think Kalmar can tell you, I'm actually quite good at doing things by the letter. Um, yes, you dot your I's and cross your T's very tediously sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm literally quite good at it. And then when I come to the practical aspects of things, it doesn't always go that well. So the first time I caught a swarm, I caught it with my left gum boot while I was wearing it. And because my suit rode up and all the beads went into my gum boot because my aim, aim was off. And it became a big thing for me because when you had six hives, fickle weather as you have in Sweden, you can have raining and you're working 60, 70 hours a week on the busy weeks at work. And then you're supposed to follow this regime, it became quite overwhelming and daunting. So then I decided to do the other thing. And that was, what am I really doing? What is my goals and what are my aims? And number one, I had read up all about the bees so now I started reading up a little bit more about how the Varroa might actually work. Because it came to me that if I keep, treat the bees and do what I want with the bees in one way, and then I do the Varroa mite handling in another way, then I'm double working it. So the simplest way to go forward is try to find a rhythm to do the bees and the rhythm to do the Varroa and join them two into one thing. So I started thinking, okay, the Varroa might go in to the larvae a bit before capping, then you get a few more mites out. And after the new bee is hatched, you have a few more, few more uh, mites. So how do you break this cycle? Well, simple, breaking a cycle is you make a nucleus colony and then you treat, let the, all the brood hatch out and then you treat the nucleus colony because when you remove the cap brood, you remove mites from the mother colony. And you can also assess how much you have in the mother colony by how much you have in the nucleus colony. And if you are a little bit lazy, like I am, you make nucleus colony, one nucleus colony from several mother colonies, and suddenly you can assess your entire apiary in an afternoon, instead of spending a week managing the entire apiary. So what is the basis, what is the problem with this mite? It is a mite that lives on the adult bees, but it reproduces in the brood and the reproduces by drinking the hemolymph of it, of the uh, larvae. And the cycle goes that the female mite goes down, she lays an egg that is a male, and then she lays several eggs that are female, the, the male and female mates, and you get more mites. But the good thing here is, if I remember correctly, up to 25% of the males or infertile. That means that there would not be more, uh, you would get unmated female mites that can't 
um, yeah, they can't <clears throat> generate um, anything but male um, mites when they go down, which means that you can actually, with just removing drone brood, limit the cycle of the mites. So as long as you keep the mite numbers feasibly below, it's actually not that hard from a backyard perspective to manage a hive with varroa mite. The problem starts when you get varroa mites going down into the drone brood, because then you get so many new mites that you can get in the scenario with your two mites going down into the same larvae cell, and then you almost have a hundred percent chance of reproduction, and you're going to get four to six um, new mites out. The other thing is this: that varroa mites. You, there's many uh, sources on this, but my, my practical experience is varroa mites can survive a winter quite well, unfortunately. And I was told in Sweden the main reason why varroa mites numbers drop during the winter is not that the mite themselves dies, of course, some of them die by their own, but the bee they're sitting on dies, fall down to the bottom of the hive, and the mites gets too cold to crawl back up and dies. Uh, the other thing is with the um, Victorian conditions, we only have a winter that I would say is um, autumn to spring because it doesn't really get cold. But it still gives us that window when there is no brood and that makes mites simpler to handle. If you're up in Queensland, for instance, it could be a little bit more full on because if you're sitting on brood all, all year round, there's no break in the mites. Of course, you can then easily generate a break in the mites by making a nuke or replace the queen or requeen in different ways. So that's that part. So when you work those things together and then you start understanding, okay, how quickly does the mite grow? And you see in the beginning of the season, you have a few mites coming in from spring and you have treated them in the autumn to get the numbers down. So you have a nice um, wintering for the bees. It actually takes the mites several months to ramp up. So in Sweden, the, the season is basically March until October and it takes the mites uh, six months to get to a problematic state. So the first time, if you do a good wintering of your hives and you do nothing, you have six months grace period where nothing really happens. But the problem is then when you go into winter, the number of bees drop, the number of bees drop quicker than the number of mites. And when you come back to next spring, then you have the problem. But if you think about the mites are completely dependent on brood being present. So if you're halfway through here, replace the queen. And um, I think Ben Bees had a podcast with a man from Newcastle, uh, um, from um, UK, uh, that was talking about that he was caging his queens for 21 days in the middle of the season just to break the brood. And voila, you stop this exponential growth of mites. When you break the brood, you can treat all the bees because there's no brood, which means you treat all the mites in the hive. So you can drop, drop it from several thousand mites back down to maybe a hundred in a day or two. So it's, it is completely possible, but the trick is to figure out what works for you and how do you want to do it and what's the way forward. And also what they're going to allow us to use if we actually need to end up treating. Yes, uh, that is a um, very important um, part of it because I think everything, whenever, whenever you have a change that requires regulation, 
it's going to take time. If you look at look at the uh, response in New South Wales, in the beginning they were burning the boxes because it was a kiss operator and keep it simple. You have to a large operation, you have to keep it simple. Then they managed to work out a way that you don't need to burn the boxes any longer and so forth. It will be refined as long uh, as as the process go forward, it will be refined and getting better and better. But when you start, you make the rules simple. And the other thing is, of course, there are many ways to treat varroa mites, and I will just mention them as, uh, as because I don't want to get in the situation where we need to treat hives. And if you're going to treat hives, then, then we are back to what are allowed in Australia. But uh, the prescription chemicals are the go-to way to treat if you don't know what you're doing. And, uh, and in some cases, if you have too many hives and, and yeah, circumstances, and they work very well. The main problem with them is um, you have to swap them out. You can't use the same thing year on year because the mite will eventually become resistant. The second thing is also to keep in mind, even though everyone talks about varroa mite and so forth, but as I showed on the previous slide, it takes a good season for the mites to build up in a hive. Even if you get mites in your hive tomorrow, everyone else had a, got one mite in our hive tomorrow. Next season, we're going to be fine with our treatment because there's one mite and that mite has to reproduce up until a number of mites that can cause a problem for the hive. So it's not that you need to uh, do something urgent and drastically. You just need to figure out over a period of time what you need to do. And it's not like you need to treat the hives every week. You need to figure out a way to keep the mites under control. And I'll come back to that in a little bit. Uh, and I mean, I managed to maintain 20 hives while I was working full time and, and the apiaries were three hours from where I lived. So I can only go to them on the weekends. So if, if it was pouring down rain, I wouldn't open the hives. So it is easy. Uh, there are, uh, I never used one of these prescription chemicals uh, for the simple reason you get you get residue in the wax they cost money uh, and so forth uh, I like that juice oxalic acid and lactic acid and formic acid and so forth I test around a little bit and I found a balance that worked for me and then you have the general thing that is uh, important the high management the simplest thing you do, you, you simul stimulate the bees, the queen to lay drones, you remove the drones when they're capped, you can then check the drone, basically drone uncapping that we do in our uh, sugar shake and alcohol wash protocol twice a year. But this is more doing it on a scale to generate extra drones, you can remove drones because the mite prefer drones, drone larvae. So when you remove the drones after they're capped, then you have um, removed a large portion of, of uh, the mites. And it takes 24 days for the uh, drones to hatch. So that's something you do every two weeks or so. And that's quite good. And if you have a routine that you're checking your hives every two weeks for, for swarming anyway in spring, cutting out or replacing a frame of drone road, that's two minutes extra. Did, did ah I have lost a slide. Whoops, <coughs> sorry. <laughs> um, I have uh, okay. That was not. Um, you have to do it by memory and mind. Yeah, I have to do it by memory. <laughs> so how did I get about this? Well, I'm basically started going on trial and error because in the proper management routine by the book, you're supposed to inspect your hive. You're supposed to every spring, you count, you had a bunch of dead bees often in the hive. You scrape them all out and you, you put them in alcohol and you, you counted the number of whites in there. Then you put in a little plastic tray with 
to collect mites that fell in down and you check that every week. And in the end, I had other things to do in my life to run around checking hives. So I just made the management decision. All my hives are completely fully infested with hives and I treated them accordingly. So what I did was I made, made nukes and when I made the nukes, I treated the hives. I checked the nukes uh, after the brood had hatched to see how much there was and worked treating of the hives and looking for Maroa into the routine. And once you have the experience, you, you work up the experience of doing this thing, you learn how to see if it works or not. You do a little bit of trial and error. It's very important because I can talk one or two hours exactly how I did it. But when you come to beekeepers in general, you have two beekeepers in a room, you have three opinions. If you're lucky, normally. Oh, that's right <laughs> Yeah. So, but the principle is if you learn a little bit how the bee dynamic and watch how the bee dynamic over the season is, and then you learn a little bit about how the mite dynamic is and how the mite dynamic over the season is. And this is not rocket science, it's just a few pages in the book, 10 pages, total to read. Then you can see. Since you know that the mite only reproduces in the brood, how are you going to attack that? How do you break the cycle? Some people say, well, I want to see if I can get varroa resistant mites. That's fine. But I think it's very simple just to, you make a nuke or, and you treat it, or you ask someone for help. I'm sure there's going to be a beekeeper out there that's going to be helping members um, who need um, little assistance getting going, just as we have mentoring programs and so forth today. Um, but the problem lies on the larger scale. Many of us have, have uh, beekeeping as a hobby and we look at it, it would be nice if the bees made uh, cover their own costs with wax and honey and whatnot. But if you had to spend 50 bucks a year or $100 a year to keep your hive alive in the first two or three years until you figured out how to do it yourself, that's not really a major issue. But the issue comes when you are a bigger beekeeper, you have hundreds or thousands of hives and your livelihood is depending on it. Then, then it becomes more of an issue. This, the other thing is also, it is normal with Varroa mite, you will get winter losses. I checked the ABC report from, I think it was two days ago, that said that New Zealand had 110,000 hive losses this winter. Sweden, when I was living there, had Out of how many hives though, Hawkeye? What was, is it like half um, of their hives or? Uh, the, the report said 13 percent, so 900,000, 800, something like that. So it's closer to a million hives. And it's not evenly distrib dib distributed, I would guess, because it wasn't in Sweden, I was living there. And it, it all depends on the winter conditions uh, and how the hives are in general. And that's the other thing we have very good in Australia. We don't have many of the other pests. Okay, we have the small high beetle, we have the wax moth, but I'm thinking of the more the viral diseases. The viral diseases are the second problem with Varroa. Since Varroa drinks the hemolymph of uh, the larvae, it basically works the same way as a mosquito um, malaria mosquito the malaria mosquito gets infected then it passes it on to the others and you have the same problem with the varroa mite when the mother gets infected it passes on to the daughters or if the larva is infected the mites get infected and it becomes a vector and australia doesn't have that so the problem will be slow 
if you look at New Zealand, it's taking them 20 years to get to the point of 15% or 13% losses. But they will, we will get there too. And it's going to be different how you manage the hives in Queensland when it's nice and sunny and warm and you have brood all year round or how it's going to be in Victoria. Some of these methods have a maximum temperature that most recommendation I've seen for the organic uh, acids, they say 25 degrees, which of course rules out most of the year in, in, uh, in uh, Queensland. And others have a minimum temperature that might rule out parts of the year for Victoria. So it's all give and take. Uh, the other thing uh, I'd like to also think about this is uh, one of the things when we talked about uh, varroa mite in Sweden and so forth, and, and that was one, one thing a beekeeper in Sweden said, we got this, we, we don't have bears. And he was talking about the grizzlies in uh, America because they would come in and they would um, chase the beekeeper off the apiary if he was, if, if he was daft enough to hang around and then he would, they would smash up the hives. If we work together, I'm quite sure we still can keep Varroa out of Australia. Um, even though the news is saying it's 38 sites, but if you read the fine print, they're all linked. They still have, as they said with, with COVID, the contact tracing, they still have uh, all of them tracing back to the original found hives. They haven't found hives that have popped up that can't be traced. So we have a very good chance of kicking this out. Um, since the advice is going to be changing and so forth, I'm not going to be specific. I just say, please follow the DPI advice. Do the sugar shake and alcohol wash and drone on capping. And I would recommend doing it more often than required. Um, just the earlier we catch this, the earlier we, uh, the bigger is our chance to uh, get rid of it. And keep in mind, even though we're looking at New South Wales, they could still come in a ship in the deport from Melbourne and we can have a second Varroa incursion at the same time. So just because there's a Varroa mite in your hive, it doesn't mean that game over. It could be completely unrelated to New South Wales, which would be maybe the best news. Uh, and ideally we won't find any. And ideally in, in one month's time, there are no sites found after today. So we have from a really good time period of the year when we are in the winter, there's not much movement of bees going on. The colonies even in, even in uh, New South Wales and so forth are still quite small. So there's a high chance of the mites being on the bees and not down in the brood, all of them. Um, so I think we, uh, I think we have a real good fighting chance to kick this stuff out. Fingers because, crossed. Huh? Yes, but there's so much known about Varroa mite. Yeah. Um, and we also have the unfortunate but maybe necessary method that you can bait bees with the uh, poison and kill off feral hives. And I believe that's going to be very closely watched and they can be shut off if they notice that the wrong kind yeah. of things are visiting. Yeah. Um, just a little question. Yep. I've noticed on the bottom of your slide there, it says never place a hive near a roof without a snow guard. Yeah. <laughs> you want to talk about that? I could. All of <laughs> probably those not, probably at the not bottom. applicable for many people here in Australia. <laughs> well, maybe not. But all of those little things at the bottom there, is uh, stuff that I have messed up. So that was <laughs> a place 10 hives on the east side. Obvious to us, sweet. Yeah, Richard, yes. <laughs> huh? Richard, Richard has commented, he said, obvious to us, Swedes. Yeah. Yes. 
<laughs> yes, so I oh. placed the hive on the eastern side of an old chicken shed because that's where the sun comes in the spring and I want, and it was a little bit colder part of Sweden and so forth. And I put them on a nice high stand, half a meter or so off the ground. And then we got another one of those snow winters similar to the, uh, I don't know if it, was, if it was this year or not, you see here, but came a good warm hot day and it went smoosh. All the snow came off the roof and all my pen hives at that time got buried in the snow. I had to dig them out. <laughs> all ten hive made it. One of them lost the queen, but they all made it. So bees are very much they're hardy. They are much hardy. I mean, they're still European honeybees. Okay, uh, maybe um, there are some bees I shouldn't mention that I not that keen on. But mm, yeah, even even Italian bees can handle winter. Fifth, the fifty hives I brought down from Queensland were all Italian, and they were doing well done. And they went yeah. from a tropical climate down to here. So mm, it, yeah. European honeybees- They're adaptable. They're adaptable. They're very apt adaptable and they can really, really handle a cold temperature if you, if you let them adapt to it. Yeah. I would also say, please let, uh, if you have, know people that aren't registered, uh, please uh, register, encourage them to register. And if you feel really strongly about it, maybe even send a little notice to DPI. There's some unregistered hives here, etc. Um, I also definitely think that feral colonies should be uh, reported to the council or whoever is appropriate, so they can I ideally be relocated into a hive, or in worst case scenario, uh, ex um, exterminated because they don't add anything. And with Varroa and even AFB and so forth, they're just a vector for disease and they could be stealing habitat for other animals. So we don't like that. Varroa is definitely not the end. Uh, it will change how we need to keep the bees if we can't kick it out. And that's an if. And it won't change anything this season really this season is fine. After that, if it stays here, then, then we'll see. But it's still going to take, I mean, Australia is a big continent. You can get many countries in here. And if you look at the map over New, uh, New Zealand, it took several years for Varroa to spread all over New Zealand. So there's many pockets of Australia that could be uh, Varroa free for 10 years to come. And I know, like, you know, there's different rules for Western Australia and Tasmania. I believe yeah. South Australia still doesn't have small hive beetle. Like, yeah. we can put things in place from state to state to be able to help with that. Now, yeah. it's um, 20 past eight. Um, are yeah. you ready for some questions? Yes. I just have one, one last thing. Great. Okay. And that is make mistakes. That's the best way to learn. Like bees in your boot. Come again? Like bees in your rubber boot. Yes, I didn't get stung, but I did. <laughs> or, but also, don't use your right, right on to knock your hives over. Yeah. <laughs> You've done that too, have you? Of course. <laughs> you need some driving lessons. Is that why you drive so carefully now? <laughs> One of the reasons. Now, okay, so we've got some questions and a few around drones. Um, yeah. So Rhonda said, I know the mites prefer drone cells, but will they also use worker cells? Yes, but I don't know the exact numbers, but it's like uh, um, two to one. So if, if, if you have, if you give the mite free pick, two out of three would go down yeah. into drones and one in worker. The trick with the drawback with the drones, if you go back, if I go back to, uh, this slide here is drone remains capped for longer. Yeah. And this period here is the important time. I don't remember the times off my top of my head. If, if they cap changed. at day nine, I think, isn't it? So day nine yeah. to 24. Yeah. So that's 16 days. And then the, the uh, mite, she lays an egg with a certain interval. Yeah. Which means that 
for a worker brood, it is normally two mice that can hatch. But since not all make it, and some of the females are, are sterile and so forth, and some of the males are sterile and so forth, females are mates, you get 1.2. But since there's so much longer time for the drones, you get almost 2.2 new bees per, per yeah. cycle. Um, someone else wanted to know, do you think having a drone frame in the hive is a good idea and have you tried this or not? Yes. A, a I, full frame and yes. sacrificed it. Yes, I used to sacrifice sacrificial frames uh, and I gave them to my chickens. So what you do, you, you take an ordinary frame. You can do it two ways, but this is how I did it. Uh, you take an ordinary frame and then you take a sidebar and put it in the middle of it. You divide it in two pieces and you put the starter strip at the top. Uh, then you let the bees draw that out. If you have ordinary comb around it and you place it near or in, in the side of the brood, uh, you have a very high chance of the uh, workers drawing that frame out as a drone frame. Yeah. Once one section is capped you cut that up and then you can you can then you can then so you basically alternate it to you, you cut half of the the frame out one week and then you wait two weeks and you cut the other half of the frame out to separate it by the piece of wood in the middle uh, the other way you can do it is that you buy a foundation that is the size of a drone frame so when the bees draw that out, you get a natural uh, drone size comb. And when you put that in the brood box, the queen will lay drone eggs in it. Yeah. And you, uh, can, you can also buy um, plastic foundation that has drone comb. Yeah. Um, on and too. so what I used to do in, in Sweden was I, I, let, I, I let the bees make those frames, one, like one extra let them fill it with honey, because you also need a drone at some point for mating. Uh, let them fill it with honey. And then when uh, um, winter came, I would extract it, spin that frame out, and then I would put it in the brood um, as a sticky. That means that as spring came around, if the queen wanted to lay a drone, she now had a whole frame full of drone cells available for her to lay. If when she started laying drone, she would then automatically draw mites into the drone brood and reduce the load on workers. So there's many ways and tricks you can do. Um, do you freeze the drone brood before you feed it back to the chickens? Do you need to kill off the mites or like if you just threw it straight to the chickens, is there a chance that the mites might make their way back to the hive? Um, I don't think they, they managed to make the hive way back to the hive. My chicken coop and my hives were 100, 150 meters apart. At the right. distance. But probably uh, would be sensible. Yeah, um, and the chickens would really go for it. So um, again, you would, I wouldn't recommend doing that in Australia, because of the AFB and the regulations around here. So if you would if you would do that in Australia, you have to make sure that B can't access that drone comb. So I guess you have to feed it inside a chicken coop or something. Uh, but um, I had a little bit special in my area because I was the only beekeeper for uh, 20 or 30 kilometers. So there were no other bees around. Um, now, about all the nukes, everyone keeps saying splitting nuke, like make lots of splits and stuff. But I know for hobby beekeepers, mm. they don't want millions of hives. And, and you know, sometimes making a nuke is a tricky thing. Like, mm. can you merge them back together? How would you handle that, you know, as far as using it to help control the mites, but not ending up with hives that you need to sell? You can always merge hives back together. Uh, and the the way I, so, well, I always wanted more hives and uh, 
because I could sell hives in Sweden as well. So I always wanted more hives. But how would I merge a hive? Well, if the, the nuke is there for varroa control, so the, the nuke provides you two things. It, it provides you a break in the brood. You get all the varroa that's in that nuke or in that hive up onto the bees. You can treat them. So they're not, they're not protected by the cap brood because most things, most treatments that work on cap brood would actually kill the bees. So if you use formic active acid at the strength to affect varroa mites in the cap brood would kill any bee that isn't in the cap brood. So that's why it's much simpler to draw the mites up out of the cap brood by removing the cap brood. Yeah. That's, that's the one step. The second thing is, uh, you getting a younger queen as well, because varroa mite is an irritant to the hive. And one thing that when bees get um, irritated enough, they can abscond. So there's a higher risk for swarming or absconsion with varroa than without it. So that could make a reason for you to want to keep younger queens than you would otherwise. So what you could do is you can make a nuke get that established and then when you know that the new nuke is working fine the brood pattern and so forth is good and she's laying you can then actually kill the queen in the old hive and so as mean as it sounds it would be better just to have a, a one or two year old queen that can lay a lot more and keep ahead of the mites than yes. an older queen that's going to be laying a lot slower and and not outpace yes. yeah right yeah yeah so it's a numbers game. It's, it's the relationship between bees and mites and this relationship between brood and mites. So as long as you have 90% or more of your brood with no mite in it, you have a healthy colony. Yes. But when you get 50% of your brood affected by mites or more, you're going to have a colony that, that, that if it runs into any stresses, birth or small hive beetle or anything, it will struggle because it's like, one of the... it's like having a bucket that's almost full of water yep. and then you add another stress and it just piles over the top and their whole immune system yep. collapses yeah 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 yep. exactly so you can then in the beginning of the season make a nuke and let that queen establish itself once you're happy with how that behaves then you can actually remove the queen from the other hive other part of the hive let them go queenless treat them for varroa. So, so, so you first, when you make nuke, you treat the varroa in the nuke and you get rid of most of varroa there. Then you can basically turn the old hive into a nuke, remove the queen, treat the varroa there. And then once that is done, you just join them together again. Yeah. So you hey. rarely under two, three months have two hives, but then you join them back together. Yeah. Did you want to stop sharing your screen or was there something else you wanted to show? No, no, that's fine. Um, Anna has um, said something interesting here. Is interesting fact, the latest science indicates that the varroa mite feeds on the fat bodies of the bee rather than its hemolymph. So yeah. there you go. I guess, you know, we're with research, we're learning more and more stuff um, all the time, aren't we? Mm. And being able to refine what we do. Um, now, I am going to address um, a, a question here, which we're not going to get into because part of Hive Buddy, we're really clear in Hive Buddy, we don't want this to become a political platform. We are here to support each other. Um, and I know that we have some governing bodies. I know that they've had this, these plans in place for a very long time, about 10 years. I know that there are teams of people like myself in the background that have done training mm -hmm. and, you know, people are getting deployed to work on this issue. And right now our main goal is to stop this in its tracks. So I think they're taking this all very seriously. And personally, I want to just trust what our governing bodies are doing. This is a huge issue. We know that arm and pollination is coming up. Um, and, you know, besides that, we're not going to get into any further discussion because 
none of us have the answers. We're not there in doing that job. We're not there making those decisions. So no, I think but, if we have any doubts and questions, the best thing to do would be to go to those governing bodies and ask them directly, have yeah. you considered this? Have you considered that? Because um, really, you know, we could get into a bitch fight about it, but ask them directly if you've got concerns and worries. Yeah. Yes, and I did actually ask Nikki about that. Nikki Jones. Uh, I should uh, so, and at the moment they are not letting any hives in from New South Wales to Victoria. The only thing they're doing is preparing a permit system, and that permit system is for anyone who wants to move hives to the almonds, and anyone who wants to move hives interstate. And that can be from South Australia or, or and and they also urge us in general to keep much better track of where we move hives. If you catch a swarm and bring it to your apiary, write down the street address where that swarm came from. Write down on the hive which hive it actually is in the apiary that has the swarm. Yeah. If you uh, this kind of thing, think about it that way. They I will mean, always, there will always be a cost benefit at some time. They will not, as they would not say we're going to eradicate Varroa if it's no longer feasible to do so. But yeah. we have only 38 hives, and there are hundreds of people at the ground looking and doing a contact tracing. And with COVID, I think we're quite good at contact tracing by now. And, you know, having met, I've met people from Agriculture Victoria personally, and they really do care. And like, yeah. They're small in number. If you want to make a change, let's try and get more funding for our Department mm -hmm. of Primary Industries as a whole so that we can have more stuff so that they can do the best job possible. Um, mm -hmm. You know, but like I said, take those questions straight to those governing bodies because yeah. that's what they're there for. And I'm sure if you've got a valid question, they, they're going to consider it um, and they're yeah. going to give you an answer. I think their transparency and the constant updates that we're getting on social media. Yeah. Like, fantastic that they're doing that. So, anyway, um, have we can got I, any more questions for Hawken about Varroa? Can I, I can see that there's no new ones that have come up, uh, Carmel, but I did just want to throw out something very quickly to you all. Um, firstly, I've noticed a few people that have come in probably since in the last 20 minutes or so. If you've missed the first half of our conversation, don't worry, we're recording it. We'll post it to the Hive Buddy page, so you can uh, Facebook page, so you can check that out later, so you can catch up on the bits you've missed. But Hawken, what you've confirmed for me, as our other chat people that we've had a chat with in the last few weeks, is beekeeping will go on. Beekeeping yep. is here to stay. Honey will still be in our cupboard in, at home. Honey will still be on the supermarket shelves. We'll still get to do what we love to do. And I've said exactly that same thing at each of these sessions because I hope that that just that that whole idea just reaches a few more people each time we have one of these sessions, mm -hmm. and it just brings some confidence and calm to the entire situation. And what you've done tonight, from from my perspective, is you've layered over some really simple, straightforward approaches yeah. for how we should be thinking about this. And I love the fact that you've gone back to the basics. And I think we can overdo, I think we can overlook this. And it's the basics of understanding the biology of the bee. But you've added one more element and the Varroa mite, something we've not had to fo focus too much attention on here in Australia previously. I've always been a big fan of like, get your head around the biology of the bee. Because if you know that you can, have so many tricks up your sleeve and answers to questions um, or answers to problems, I should say. But now we just need to focus that to also learn about the Varroa mite. And maybe maybe all this effort we're going to now is a bit ahead of the game. And maybe, maybe in another six months, all this is not going to matter until one day it does. But how good is it that we're all here having these conversations now? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, one, one thing also to add is this is not a random chance that we found the mites. They were, no, the picked up. Hive did its job. they were picked up in a sentinel hive and the sentinel hive had been there for years because they have, I mean, with everything, you have a limited budget or everybody, or everybody would be driving a Lamborghini if they wanted to. 
So we have always a limited body for everything. And I think it's actually quite marvelous that in New South Wales DPI, as small as it actually is with the number of B inspectors there, they managed to pick, all right, there's a high risk spot here that is gonna be an incursion and they got it. Think about that for a bit. I mean, look at the continent. It's, uh, you don't drive from here to uh, Sydney huge. in one day, most people, you don't. And you're not even, you're not even at the, the infested zone yet driving there. So have some um, confidence and, and, and um, trust in that the people that are working on these strategies have actually given it a bit of thought. There are quite many good researchers in Australia for CSIRO and other places and universities that have very well been aware about Varroa. I mean, this, this, this is a little bit the parallel to, uh, oh, is you can draw with foot and mouth. It's all about the news too. Australia has never had foot and mouth before. And it's going to be devastating for cattle because it's so infectious. For raw might is on, on the other hand, not really that infectious, just just um, difficult to be rid of once you get it. So well, we might um, wrap all of that up. Um, I just wanted to say you had a few, I had, there was a bit of Swedish conversation going on earlier as well from between Richard and Carl. They were, so we've, we've got a couple um, here tonight that um, probably could quite relate to you, Hawken, which is kind of nice. Um, yes. and, and you know, what you brought home for me as well is that your climate there in Sweden is so different to Australia. And you've also had some time up in Queensland as well, which again is, is so different um and you know i guess we're all if if it's if it's here to stay hopefully it's not um but you know learning about local stuff is really important but i love here on hive buddy that we can all come together and we can share stuff but we can you know we can really burrow down to our local stuff here on hive buddy we, we can go really big as well and um and give ourselves you know a much bigger picture of of what everyone's dealing with in all different places. Now, what's Craig said here? I imagine if they hadn't got it, I think that they are on this and that we are very lucky we have them doing that. Yes, mm. absolutely. Thank God for the Sentinel Hive all around Australia and at our airports. And, yep. you know, that they've even put stuff like that in place. So anyway, Hawken, thank you for tonight. It's been um, fantastic. I know Simon has really enjoyed your talk tonight. Um, and, you know, maybe we'll get you back on Hive Buddy another time as well. Um, I hope you've all gotten some value. Craig loved it as well. Thank you, Craig, for your claps. Um, it's been really great. Um, now, tonight does kind of wrap up our public talks on Hive Buddy because, as I said, we're, we're focusing now on launching our bee club. And, um, and we've got that little surprise for you in the background working on, um, you know, because as I said, we're aware that this is a stressful um, situation. So if any of you are struggling, please um, go to the Arbic Facebook page or the Arbic site. They have put stuff in place and we will keep you posted on more updates. Remember to put your photos up and vote for our photo competition and, um, and we'll see you in the Hive Buddy community. So thanks again, Simon, did you want to say anything before we go? Uh, wonderful job, Hawken, um, and so great to have such a good turnout. Thanks for your time, everybody. See you all. Take care. Bye.